do want to welcome everybody to another Grit Berkman Coaches Cafe. We're going to have, I hope, a really good session today because we, we want uh, the people that are on live with us to share some of your biggest Grip Berkman challenges. What has been your biggest challenge? It can be recent. It could be an old story. Hope that we might even get a little bit of humorous stories that will come across uh, this morning. Uh, so anything that you have to share, and also that we might be able to share some, um, some counsel with each other. As we go through the process, what I, what I want us to talk about is what was your biggest challenge, and if, if there was something that you felt did not go right, then what was it that didn't go right? You might even know some of the why it didn't go right. What did you do? Uh, what would you do differently if you had it to do over? And then we'll give uh, other people a chance to kick in uh, and say, hey, here's something you might consider if that happens again. Or, you know, maybe even if someone says, I have a similar situation to that, and here's what we did. That would be but we'll be sharing your greatest challenges uh, as a Grit Berkman coach. And uh, let's, let's keep it in that, uh, in that realm of our Grit Berkman coaching and not just uh, coaching in general. So before we get started, uh, I'm going to ask us to have a word of prayer. And Shannon, I'm going to ask you if you would to uh, lead us in that word of prayer to get us started. I will. Thank you. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, I, I thank you for this means to be able to gather so that we can discuss and learn from one another. Uh, you are the great teacher, so I pray, Lord, that you would uh, keep us attentive to your spirit as it guides. And Father, may, uh, may you have great pleasure as you uh, overlook this group who seeks to help others better understand themselves and serve well in your kingdom. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So who would like to be forced to share with us a great challenge that you have had? I have a fairly recent one. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm not a, uh, met up with uh, an executive director of one of uh, the uh, local veterans groups here in, in our city who actually travels nationally and speaks nationally and has a podcast nationally. And, and uh, so I guess he has, he has a national uh, ministry in that respect. But uh, we started talking about uh, team building for his staff. And I wanted him to experience a, a big, big breadth of what, uh, uh, we could do with uh, with the team, and also for him to experience uh, the the grip all the way to components on the uh, uh, on the Berkman side. And we we set up about an hour and a half appointment, so I could go through all of that material. And really, by the time we got to the end, it was just you know, I, I my intention was to give him a a taste of everything, uh, and uh, it it didn't. Uh, it didn't really leave. He didn't leave with uh, anything actionable, and and I wasn't even. Sh and, and by the time I was done with uh, uh, walking him through some of the material that that I would expect him to go uh, deeper, he just he kind of looked like he was in a fog. And uh, so anyway, I wasn't very happy with the way that coaching session went, and uh, was seeking to follow up with him uh, later. He travels a lot. In fact. Uh, one of the things that helped me set this time up with him was my trip to Dallas. He happened to be in the airport traveling from the Seattle, exactly the same flights as I was on, both coming and going. So uh, anyway, uh, the, more, the more that we went through the appointment, the more I realized that it would be very helpful for his team to be exposed to, uh, to this. But uh, but we really left with nothing really tangible for him to take away. And so I was, I, myself, I was kind of disappointed in the way that that went. So Neil, what might you have done differently? Uh, well, I was thinking about that later. I think uh, at least for that appointment, it probably would have been uh, fine to leave the grit material off and, and just focus on uh, really the map and uh, – help him to uh, at least start to work with some of the vocabulary. And, and then instead of uh, 
instead of trying to ex uh, expose him to all of like all the components and, and the interest schools and so on, would be to uh, ask, invite him to, to talk about which area he would like to go into a little bit deeper and then make sure that, that before he left, uh, he had something uh, actionable that uh, he could focus on with his team. Yeah. Uh, now, the interesting thing for me is I got to know him a lot better than I had in the hour before. And it, 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 did, ex it did expose me to how much information there is in the, the, the signature package. And uh, um, I'm not even sure he knows how much I know about him now. <laughs> uh, so let me ask uh, the, let me ask the group uh, any suggestions you might have had for for Neil in a case like that. Yes, I thought I saw you moving if forward. Like a question, that would be fine, also. Yeah, or ask any questions. That's right. Yeah. The the only thing I would say is, uh, Neil, you the two things that you said are exactly what I do each time I try to introduce somebody. I always ask them if there's something they saw because most people have looked at their report. Um, if there's something they wanted to focus on, and uh, then I always choose smaller pieces as well. Um, because it is so much material. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, I was definitely ex excited about him being exposed to what he could show to his team. Uh, and uh, we haven't crossed that bridge yet. But, uh, hmm. uh, yeah. It, it, it seems that, you know, in our training, we know we, we have kind of a fire hydrant uh, experience. When you were in the training and you were being exposed to all the wonders of the Grit Berkman and the Berkman in particular, uh -huh. you become so overwhelmed with all of that, that a lot of times in the past, especially our training was trying to be sure that we get people exposed to everything that we possibly can get them exposed to. But then we end up repeating that model when we go out with our own coaching experiences, trying to give everybody everything because that's what we got in our training. Mm. And, you know, we're trying to um, address that now and keep reminding people smaller bits are better. You know, if they get one or two good nuggets, that's enough for now. And if they want to come back for more, then great, have them come back for more. But, but it's really hard to do that when you think you might just have this one shot with the person and you want to be sure they've got everything, right? Yep. That's, that's but, a good summary. But got it all in the report there. If you can focus, you know, like you and Les were saying, if you can focus on what what they see that that they may have a question about or what is what do they see that might spur them toward action and go with that to try and uh, to get to that actionable plan that they might have uh, by the end of the session neil i have a i have a question with regard regarding the graph that you designed do you use uh use that in your presentations uh, no that's more for a, a team build or orientation. I think the the first one, uh, there's one that has just the, the grip with a kind of a coaching uh, grid below it. Yes. Uh, I just did a workshop with that one. I called it the big picture workshop and exposed uh, uh, a church group to it. There are about 20 people in the room. And uh, we did, we just did the grip. And out of that 20 people, there were six more people who wanted to uh, go through the, uh, 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 like a team build. So then I go from like uh, 20 people and a two hour workshop to six people on a six hour workshop. Okay. Wow, that's great. Yeah. So that's how I would use the, uh, the charts or what I call the posters. Okay, so back to Neil's initial <clears throat> scenario. One of the things I've started doing now, like I don't, I just don't ever do the Berkman and the Grip in the same conversation. Yeah. I tell people right out of the, we're doing two meetings. 
and I spend about 90 minutes on the Berkman and I spend about an hour on the grip at two separate sessions. Yeah. And that really ends up, for me, that's changed everything because I typically found in the past that I was as preoccupied trying to get through everything in that one session. And it was difficult to get anything focused because there was such a pressure to get through all the material. And now that I'm just landing on the Berkman and we're just going through that and enjoying that and then doing the same with the grip, it's actually they really changed things for me in terms of the conversations I'm having. And I think that probably fits into what some pressure you were feeling, if I'm hearing you right, Neil, when you were talking about the conversation with that guy. Yep. Yep. So, Lance, do you start with the uh, Berkman? Yeah, I, I start with the Berkman first uh -huh. and kind of go from the na natural to the supernatural and then go back to the dotted and stuff at the end and it seems to have worked really well and you always have two conversations with the people then and two yeah. separate questions yeah usually i try and get them um i tell them that i want the two conversations to happen within a couple of weeks of each other that the whole thing stays fresh for them right. and that's actually working out pretty well i did one one time where nobody's fault it just is but the gap between the two of them was significantly longer due to scheduling and stuff like that I didn't feel that was as helpful because they kind of get into a bit of a role after the Berkman they're learning this stuff and they're thinking through this stuff and then if you can go right into the then and say okay well let's now that we understand how you were wired naturally let's look at how God infused his life into you by his the giftings you have, the contribution you're making, and then let's wrap that all up together. And if you do that with fairly close proximity to those two conversations, for me at least, it seems to work better. Very good. All right. Who would like to share another challenge? This is not so much a particular challenge or incident but it's it's a thing that I keep running into and I'm looking for maybe some insights how do you work with those who are not self-aware mm. I mean this is about becoming aware but I, I've had recently several conversations with people even beyond spiritual gifts and their place in the world they were just totally self not self-aware um, and it made it very difficult to take them anywhere with the tools. So, help. So, who would have some wisdom for less on that? People who are not self-aware. I think one of the things that I like about both the way the movement and the grip approach things is the multiple passes. And so the one pass is Talk to me about how other people have either affirmed or spoken into the element that we're having a conversation about. And my suspicion, <laughs> less, is that the self, the lack of self-awareness probably means they don't have a lot of insight in terms of how people perceive them. So I try and mine that out of it and try and even, if, you know, say for the, for example, you know, we've got worksheets where you can go and give them to people and get them to give you some insight and stuff like that. So getting them involved in conversation and getting feedback from other people, I think would help with that, but it, it's tricky for sure. For, for both of the lessons, uh, do, you, do you think addressing that in a team setting is more helpful than trying to just do it in a one-on-one -on -one setting. So the, currently, the people that I've had this issue with were one-on-ones, so mm -hmm. I've I've not yet seen this play out in a group setting. Okay. I've seen the light bulb come on in a group setting, right. but I've not had somebody who just continued to not get it, not see that. This is who they are. 
or who they might be. Uh, just. I had someone that was like that. Um, and, and it's very interesting about two weeks later, this person came up to me and she was like, you know, I've really been thinking about what you presented. And she's like, I think I'm noticing it that is in my life. And so now I'm looking for it and praying about it and, you know, seeing if that actually is who God has made me to be. So sometimes it's hard for me to be with people that, that don't quite get that light bulb, like, aha, you know, this is what it is. But uh, sometimes if I just say, okay, God, you need to show them because I tried um, using this assessment. And if it is, you know, who they are, then show them. And yeah, the one person that didn't, wasn't quite with me through the whole thing came back to me and said, you know, I think that is a part of me to the point where when we did a group, our team group thing, everyone in our team um, was saying to this person that that definitely is you. I see it here, 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 and here. And then again, she picked it up more and went, oh, so there was a couple weeks she was avoiding me. I think she was trying to process it all. Um, but then, and then we got a chance just to talk because she works with me also. So um, sometimes we just have to let the, you know, God just speak into her life and show them um, that, that that is, you know, how he has made, made them to be. Um, other than that, I don't have anything else. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. that's, great. that's a great word, Debbie. Yeah, and Debbie, that's, uh, that's something that I found helpful too is that like helping a person uh, form a question to somebody they trust that knows them well. So after they've met with me and we've, you know, we've looked at maybe their stress or their needs, uh, something that's showing up, just to ask them, say, now who, who can you sit down with and ask them these questions? For example, you know, when, when have you seen me, like in a positive way, when have you seen me friendly or decisive and energetic? Give me an example. Or maybe if it's in the, the stress behavior, um, when have you seen me ignoring social conventions? Or when have I been in a meeting and I've, I've always, you know, I've placed the worst possible uh, solution that could be there. And this, you know, let that trusted person give them feedback. And it, then it kind of maybe helps uh, link some awareness because of actual events where those behaviors have been observed. Um, that's, that's one thing I've done with the one-on-one. When, when it's in a group, Usually the rest of the group chimes in and says, oh, yeah, we've seen that. <laughs> and they let, they let them know, which can be a little alarming, but with the one-on-one, -on -one, just letting them go to a trusted person and ask questions. It's been helpful. Yeah, finding that safe person, right, that uh, help them to say, you know, who is that safe person that you can, that, that will tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. Les, when you're doing this uh, with pastors or prospective pastors, are you also doing it with their wives? Uh, yes. Yeah, I've, I, I started long ago when I was working with church planters. I discovered that I learned more from facial expressions on the wives than what's coming out of the planters' mouths because they're looking to me for checks and they want to be impressing me and the wives just want their husbands not to explode. Um, you know, uh, so yes, I've, I've been doing that for quite a while. Yeah, watch for um, that, particularly the elbow going into the ribs there. <laughs> yeah, they usually sit beside and slightly behind, so when they're making faces, that the husband doesn't see it. So it works out well. Uh, I have a question. Uh, we have those worksheets that go with the grip, where you can invite other people to speak into their lives. You know, uh, has anybody played with creating things like that for small pieces of the Berkman, where they can go outside of the group experience for those who are actually doing or walking through the Berkman and maybe ask people about different parts yeah. or is, is there yeah. anything like that? The only thing I'm aware of is Berkman does have a 360 degree instrument. It's another okay. questionnaire that's about $155, I think, uh, to take that one. Um, I have, I, I saw it in the early days when it, when they first launched it. And we have not used it to, because it's more focused on management, leadership uh, uh, issues. 
But for what you're saying, I'm not aware of anybody having uh, developed any kind of a 360 sort of thing for people to dialogue specifically about that. Um, okay. There are some opportunities to use some of the insights reports to stimulate some of those kinds of conversations, but I'm not aware of anything else. So, um, yeah, that might be a good idea. I've got a note there to, to talk to the folks at Berkman about what about the possibility of something like that? Might there be something of a dialogue guide that they could use with someone besides a professional coach or consultant? Good idea. Any other words for, for Les? By the way, Les, there is one thing I would mention that um, many times when I see, for those of you, I guess everyone here on this call, yes, is all, we're all, um, at the uh, signature certification level, whenever you have people whose scores on several of the components are same, 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 if you have high, 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 low, low, low uh, scores, uh, that's a good indication that they are saying, yeah, I'm this way, isn't everybody this way? Actually, they're not even asking the question, they're saying, I'm this way and everybody else is this way too, that is their assumption. And that's part of where some of the blind spots can come from, the blind sides, because they, um, they don't understand that other people might have a different perspective on the way they are dealing with uh, emotional intelligence, let's say, or self-consciousness. And uh, those are two areas that are probably, you know, some of the uh, bigger ones that we see with the failure to have good self-awareness. So you might just, uh, when you're coaching, look at that and be watching out for that. And as you're helping them to see, you know, you see this and the way you've answered the questionnaire indicates that you think everybody else sees this exactly the same way you do. And they're probably going to say, well, yeah, isn't everybody that way? <clears throat> and you then can say, well, let me just tell you that the answer is no. There, there is another way that many people do look at it. And as you're coaching them, you might even say, so let's talk about a situation when you felt like you were misunderstood and, and get them to describe that situation. And then you can come back to saying, might it be that this is where some of that problem was coming from because you were expecting them to behave this way, but they didn't behave that way. And that's where the problem came because you weren't aware that what you were doing was not the way they were expecting you to behave either. So it, now that can be very painful. And I have had some people that have said they really did not like the Berkman. I've had a very, very few people who have said that, but a few people that said, you know, I was just turned off by the Berkman. And most of the time they were outliers when we were doing a team build. And they, they said, hey, this just confirmed that, you know, people just don't get me is kind of what they said. And they didn't like that. We had to really do a lot of nurturing with those people to try and help them understand but you've got a unique contribution here that the rest of the team doesn't have. You've got a perspective that the rest of the team doesn't get, and they need you desperately getting the team to express that to them, how much they need them. So yeah, that self-awareness thing is very important. Of course, that's one of the biggest things that Berkman is, is, is good for, is helping people with their self-awareness and their growing in their emotional intelligence. Uh, Larry, along those lines, I had a, uh, a piece of feedback after I did uh, a team build, and uh, it was kind of surprising to me, but uh, I think it fits in this vein. Uh, after we did the, the uh, six-hour team build, uh, a number of the, the uh, participants said that they got more out of the team build than they did with the individual coaching session. Yes. And I, and I think that had a lot to do with building the self-awareness that, uh, that comes by seeing how other people respond, how, how the fact that uh, sometimes there's people in the room whom they've worked side by side with, they realize, oh, I'm, I'm a, in, a, in the green square and they're in the, in the blue. Now I see where, where the differences are. And, uh, and that awareness started to creep open the door uh, really for uh, more desire for individual coaching. So. Yeah, I, I agree, Neil. I've, I've seen the same thing. I think that's really important. 
I was glad for the feedback, but I was kind of sh uh, shocked by it, honestly. <laughs> Who else has another challenge for us? I have one. Um, I've been trying to present the leadership grip um, to our church. And, um, well, actually just to the elder board first and to the pastor. And he said to me, the pastor said to me, yeah, I, I can see that this assessment will be really good, but can we just do a team build and not talk about the assessments by ourselves first? And I was like, oh. <laughs> And in other words, I think he was saying, yes, this looks like a good assessment, but we really don't have time for us to all individually go through this and then do the team build together. So what kind of things do you, how do you come back to a comment like that that would help them to understand um, the significance and the importance of going through each leadership group person individually and then come together as the elder board as a team? Wow, what do you guys have to say for that? I appreciate this because I've been doing with this uh, leadership at China Outreach Ministries and our president uh, poses the same issue, uh, particularly for himself, because we're doing the cascade. We're starting at the top, working down through our area directors. So I'm very open to your <laughs> insights. Well, Larry, this is what you and I were talking about before anybody else came on when I was talking about doing our Grip Berkman presentation at our uh, assessment center a couple weeks ago, and I had added the interviews, which had never done before. Um, so I actually did that, but the leadership was like, well, that's on you to do that. I mean, they weren't carving out time. I had to figure out how to do that. But Debbie, mm -hmm. I would just encourage you, just the, you got to do what you got to do, but um, what it did for the group activity, um, they were already familiar with the words, the terms, uh, they each understood what the map was, so that when I walked them out onto the floor, I mean, they were just like, oh. it was, it was, it was amazing. Uh, you know, you see it on the page and we call it a map, but when they actually stood there and realized my continent's loaded with other people, um, uh, that, that was just amazing. So. Uh, I could just encourage you to press them, uh, figure out how to make it happen. Mm -hmm. I think Thanks. one of the things that I try and do is I try and find somebody that is open. And then once I've had a chance to get them, but they become a multiplier of the voice and the impact of the thing. So it's not just me talking to people about it. So I had a situation where I had, team that I needed to get buy-in from for the Grip Berkman. It was uh, just, for lack of a better, it's divide and conquer. You know, so I just found one that I thought I would be able to get a good outcome with, and I did, and I did get a good outcome, and now there's two of us flapping about it, and then got a third one to do it, and now there's three of us flapping about it, and now the most resistant one feels like they're being resistant which is perfect. And so then they come around and now all of a sudden people think it's a good idea, but it, it's tricky. And, and you don't always get the luxury of starting with that person at the top. If, if they're not the one that's um, advocating with you and all the rest of this, then I kind of start around them and start to see how this is having an impact because, you know, we still get the fact that this I to we thing is important and the, the group activity is actually formed by some of the discoveries that they've begun to make in their individual conversations. So I think it's good if you can still press for that, but I like Les said too, you gotta, you gotta go with what you get given too. So, but the divide and conquer things work well for me, but you gotta be real patient with that one. Yeah, when you do have a, an advocate that one person that, boy, this really helped me. Um, you know, in almost every organization, when we penetrate a new organization, it's because someone in the organization was introduced to Grit Berkman and they were really helped by it. They got excited about it. Now we're, we have a foot in the door with that new organization. 
uh, that new team. Um, so I agree, Les. Getting getting uh, that champion uh, who you know they're they're selling it and they're saying, but here's why we really need to do this. Um, I've got a group uh, that my my son and I are actually doing our first. We're co-leading our first team build on Friday. I, he was trained as a coach in 2013, but this is the first time we've done one together. So um, uh, the group that we're working with, though, uh, wanted to do a team build coming up to their uh, retreat, but the um, there, there was a little bit of difference of opinion in the leadership. The chairman of the board had one agenda that he wanted for the uh, retreat setting and the director wanted to do this team build with everybody. And the director felt it was better to bow to the chairman of the board. So uh, what we're gonna get is two hours with the, with the staff that works most closely together before they start their retreat. And at first when they, when they said, you know, we can, we can get two hours together and that's it. And I thought, that's not worth it. But my son, who's sometimes wiser than me, don't tell him I said that, um, <clears throat> said, you know, if we can get this first conversation with them, I think we'll whet their appetites and we will get to come back and do another one with them to go deeper. And I said, you know, I think you're right. I think it's worth it to do that. So uh, we're, they're, we're giving them the one-on-ones and already now that they have done their questionnaires, the director's already coming back and saying, hey, I really want to be sure that we've got one-on-ones with everybody, and I really do want to find a time when we can get back together, even if we have to do it virtually. I don't want this to just die. He's already excited about it just by taking his own uh, questionnaire and reading his reports. So we've got a foot in the door, and I think it's a very similar situation there, Debbie. If, you know, if I say, look, uh, the, the instrument it's, it's not that we are just dependent on the instruments, it's that they help us to start a conversation. And that's what we're really after. They give us common language, they give us insights, they help people to find some aha moments. And the team building is the most important part. He's right about that. But we need the instruments to help us get on the same page and have the same language in that team. One thing that uh, I'm, I'm starting to realize is that uh, people have had bad experiences in receiving feedback, yeah. and, you know, whether it was from an inventory or whether it was from an employee review or whether it was from uh, you know, a workshop that they did and they got feedback. And so the, the negative experience sometimes sets up a wall and they think that, uh, that the report is going to be just another kind of feedback to them, and uh, and and for us to like create an uh, an environment where there's self discovery, and then after the self discovery, they they come up with their own conclusions. That begins to set up a different kind of uh, feedback loop. It's a it's a self awareness loop that could continue after we're gone, which is is really much better than if uh, we created, let's say, a, a series of ongoing coaching relationships that um, made them dependent on us for, for uh, further insights. So uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm, could, I'm trying to implement more into my, uh, uh, all of my leadership stuff is that uh, empowering them to be self-aware and create an, uh, uh, kind of like a self-governing system and I haven't yet transferred that over to a whole team, but uh, having a self-governing team is uh, really is, is the goal that, that I'm uh, wanting to leave teams with before I you know, go on and do something else. Great. Shannon, I'm gonna pick on you because yesterday we were talking about another one. I wonder if you would share that one with us today. Okay. Yeah. One of the, we were talking yesterday about this topic and uh, one of the issues I faced is that when you're in a, in a team build situation and you're, you're there with maybe a, a team leader and, and team members. And uh, after going through the, the one-on-one coaching with each of the individuals and then, then looking at them as a group, 
you begin to observe that uh, the team leader is, is consistently posturing in their stress behavior. And that's what the, that's what the team consistently is seen from them. And then uh, team members are, have been fatigued by that. So they're, they're responding back with their stress behavior. And so the, um, you've got this thing where you're trying to move them from, from I to we, but everyone's, everyone's in their most negative posture <laughs> towards, towards one another. And it's, uh, that's just been a very difficult hurdle uh, to get across when, when you, when you come across this particular group, that's they're you know, they're, they're, they're under, under duress for some reason, or as a group, they've been fatigued and, everyone's not exhibiting their, their positive traits of their, of their Berkman, but they're negative. And it's, uh, that's, that's been tough trying to, trying to get over the hurdle and let people own the negative and say, okay, you are exhibiting that. Now, what can we do to get you back to a healthier place? And it's, uh, that's been a challenge to try to work a team through that. It's not been able to do it in a, in a two and a half day setting usually. What are some possible ways to, to help move the, the team leader and or the team together uh, to a better place where we can start seeing more of their, uh, less of their stress behavior and more of their uh, natural defaults? Mm. What suggestions might you have for Shannon? Uh, mostly it's a question at this point uh, are is this a team that's under pressure quite a bit and they're they're as a let's say as a matter of of their work they have a lot of pressure and stress that they have to work under yeah it, it's a it's a cross-cultural team uh working with a pretty resistant people group um but it's the stressors that most people living cross-culturally have um but I think maybe since they've not seen the results they would want, um, then that's, that probably puts a little un, unnecessary burden on, on each one of the team members. Uh, what, what was your role in, in the process? Was it, was it to help them gain awareness of, of their stress responses and, and their, let's say the field work that they were doing? Yeah, my, my role was coming in to help them with a grip, grip Berkman team build to, uh, to help them have a little more synergy and uh, mutual appreciation and understanding of one another. Um, and it was, it was actually the above level supervisor saying, this team's pretty dysfunctional. Uh, you know, he'd known that we'd done grip Berkman team builds with other teams. He said, would you mind doing it, doing one with this team to see if we can kind of help them get out of their, their trough, so to speak. Uh, what level of awareness did you help them de develop uh, relative to their context? Like, you know, <laughs> uh, the, the team members all looked at each other and realized the, the team leader, absolutely. He's working out of his stress behavior. That is what we're seeing. Uh, but he was really struggling with his own awareness that that was, that was what was happening. So, uh, but uh, yeah, they, they picked up on it really quick, very quickly. Uh, what was harder for the team members, though, was to realize they, too, were responding back to him in their stress behaviors and trying to point those out. It, again, it was easier to find fault as a group to the person above, but those below were probably more struggling to see that they were in that same uh, stress behavior posture. Shannon, were you able to zero in on needs, needs and expectations from the Berkman? Uh, we, we were, we did go through that and, uh, what we, what I tried to do and, and I think it got a little traction was, uh, aside from doing the pre, the pre one-on-ones, we did some post one-on-ones and, uh, went back through again and talked about, you know, what are you doing in your area of interest that are your high ones that give you energy and give you a positive well being? How are you able to do that? And, and even talking through the uh, the needs and saying, what are you doing on your needs area to get to get these met? Are you be, are you able to do them yourself? Or are you doing them? Are you getting help from someone else? Um, so it, I, you know, that's that's what I that was my solution was just do the post to do the debrief one on ones following the group, 
Uh, but you know, again, this was a this was a one shot for this team. They're at a distance from me, so the likelihood I can get the whole team together again is not great. Um, but th that was my solution: was doing post post one on ones to see if we can you know touch on it again. And again, it was it, that was I didn't have any other option. That was what I thought might work. But and if anybody else had some insight, I'd I'd be appreciative. What might you have done differently? That you think in that setting? Um, I wish I could have just had a couple of extra days with the team leader, just he and I. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe even just to walk through a city, sit and have coffee, let him have more time to be able to uh, to debrief it himself face to face. Um, but it. You know that that's not what I I didn't build that time in. If I had if I had known, I would have gone ahead and built in that time, just to say, hey, I'm I'm actually going to stay an extra day. You know, I don't want to be in the way, but you know, if you want to show me your city or if you want to just hang out a little bit, I'll be glad to do that. Um, that's that's something I have done with other team team builds. Now I've I've actually built in one extra day where I'm nobody's responsibility, but I'm available. Yeah, and then fly fly either that night or the next day home. Yeah, I like to do that, especially for the leader. I, I like to, um, you know, I, I've, I've become kind of adverse to talking about these as Rip Burtman debriefs. You know, we're not debriefing them from the traumatic experience of taking their reports, but, but it is a, a Rip Burtman conversation that we're having. At the same time, I do like the word debrief for the leader after the team build. I would like to debrief with that, that team leader. What did you see? What are some things that you might want to do differently as you're leading this team? Um, what are some needs that you saw in them that perhaps are not being met? And what do you need to do to help them get those needs met? But another thing I really like to do with the team and the team build is, especially toward the end when we're moving toward affirmations, to uh, get the individual to express to the team, here's what I need from you to help me be at my best and get the team, if they possibly can, to respond in some sort of way of even making a commitment. Hey, here's the way I think I might be able to help with that. Mm. Um, and um, I, I, have, I don't have good numbers to talk about how that has helped people to move out of their stress into more consistently using their usual effective positive side. But I think at least in that moment, some pretty emotional uh, reactions to that. I recall one team build that I did um, uh, a couple of years ago uh, with a team where they, they invited their two administrative assistants to join with the leadership team in the team build. And at the end, when those two assistants gave their, um, you know, they, they did their poster exercise and they shared their, um, um, uh, their profile with the, the team and we had them say and here is the strength that I think I have to bring to this team and to hear those executive leaders affirming each of them saying here's why I need you yes that is your strength and I'm gonna do everything I can to help you maximize that strength in the next several months and both of those ladies um, were in tears and they said you know no one has ever done anything like that for me before so, you know, that one thing right there, we saw a lot of their stress melt away, at least at that moment, to, to realize that they were affirmed, that they were appreciated, uh, but people had not been expressing. So that affirmation time was a huge, huge uh, moment for that team. George, so, Shannon, mm -hmm. you think about the debrief and you think about, like it sounds to me, if I hear what you're saying, like, you felt like it. Um, there was some discovery of issues that needed to be addressed, but there wasn't the time to resolve them. Right. Is that a correct ass assessment? Yeah, I think I think during the, the team build time, there was already enough uh, distrust uh, among team members towards the team leader, and uh, even just maybe even emotional fatigue with the yeah. team leader that um, n none of them really wanted to risk much in, in the room. Uh, 
mm. as far as uh, disclosing uh, how they're really dealing, how they're doing with things. Right. And so that uh, that's where it was, you know, that that's again, that's part of that uphill battle. Yeah. And, and how, what degree do you feel like the team leader started to get it, get that and sense uh, that, that some of that was there? I, I believe he started to get the things he needed as yeah. in, uh, he, you know, for example, one of his uh, interests was his outdoor score was off the chart. And he was, you know, he just kept saying, man, all I've been thinking about when I go back to the U.S. is going hunting and fishing. Mm -hmm. And so, and so, so he, he caught it for himself, but he wasn't necessarily catching the needs of, of others in the groups uh, that, he, that he might need to make some adjustments toward. So it might be good for us because I suspect any one of us find ourselves in that situation where we walk away from a team exercise feeling like we picked a scab off rather than having done something a bit more positive, right? So like, I'd be in, like, as you're sitting there now, what could you still be doing with the team leader to follow up on some of that insight and kind of work that on an ongoing basis, even with him seeing as it sounds to me, like he's more the catalyst of the challenges that the team is facing. Yeah, I, after talking with Larry a little bit about this yesterday, I, I went ahead and pulled up this person's report and, and just jotted down some notes. So I have a, an email and draft to send him basically, hey, six months since we sat down and talked about these things. You've been, you've been back in the U.S. for five months now. Just wanted to check on you. How are you doing? And, you know, kind of remind him of a couple of three or four bullet points of things that, that came up while we were together and just say, how are you doing on these things? So that's, that's something that's in, on, in the works even from yesterday's conversation with Larry. Yeah, no, I like that because I think the, to a certain extent, um, when we get in the, all those conversations and they allow us to, um, to some extent impact the dynamic of their team mm -hmm. through the exercises that we lead them through. It, I think it is good for us to think through, okay, how do we, how can we deal with the ripples from that? And if there, you know, sometimes the team's not going to allow you simply because of context or whatever, but I, I do think it's, a, I think you've raised a great point, Shannon. And it's good for us to think through how can we come back and loop back into that to really try and be a bit more, uh, redemptive rather than diagnostic. Hmm. Good word, Les. Thanks. I would also be curious if, when you loop back in, if there were times in their context, if they had experienced less pressure than the time when you had been there. And if they, if they were experiencing less pressure and maybe, uh, uh, we're, we're becoming more aware of when they're operating out of their work style, their, their strengths mm -hmm. are all, and what was that like for their team? And, you know, could they identify some, let's say, some uh, more positive feelings, some, uh, uh, some uh, better fruit from their uh, ministry, and, and be able to uh, have some awareness about those times when their context isn't so filled with stress? Hmm. I really like the idea of coming back uh, six months later and maybe even giving the team leader some tools that they can use then with their, their team. Uh, some of those insight reports, Larry, you know, let them know that those are available for them. They don't have handling conflict or time management or whatever. Uh, those are great tools that uh, be very simple to use with the team. Yeah, the two of those insights that come to my mind are um, – the biggest mistakes others can make with me and how in handling conflict. Um, uh, those two uh, you know, are zeroing in on the needs and stress. And, you know, another thing with the team, I've had some really good teachable moments with the team when we're on the Berkman map doing the floor exercise and seeing them in their, their need stress behavior where their circle square is. And taking that simple thing of acting your way out of the stress to then go back and get your need met. So if the person's got really uh, deep blue need and stress, 
walking them over to the red quadrant and saying, what are some red kinds of things that you could do right now as an immediate fix to get you out of your stress behavior? And then once you've gotten out of that, what do you need to do? And let's walk back, physically walk them back to the blue quadrant and say, now, what are some blue kinds of things, some needs that are not being met? What do you need to do to get those needs met? And sometimes, uh, in fact, quite often, uh, someone will surface with some kind of a com comment that will spur us into doing that spontaneously. And, you know, we ask permission of the person, do you mind if we, if we zero in on that right now? I've never had anyone say no at that point. And uh, so the other folks in the room are able to see that. Sometimes someone else will say, well, what about me? My stress is way over here in this yellow thing. What do I need to do? Okay, let's walk through it. Now the group even picks up on it. So group, what do you think? Here they're in this deep yellow stress. Well, let's walk them over here to the green quadrant. Group, what do you think are some things that they could do? Or ask the individual even, what are some things you can do? And it's amazing how quickly they pick up on it. Anyone else have anything else for Shannon about that? Dealing with a team that's in deep stress and headed for conflict, I suppose, Shannon. Larry, one thing I, I just wanted to say, what you just did was you showed us how to use the tool to help them answer more questions for themselves. So yeah. in other words, you're equipping them, with that exercise, you're equipping them to go back to the tool when we're gone, when we're not, not there anymore, to, uh, to go deeper, to develop them as, themselves as a team, and to gain greater awareness. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, think, for Neil. That's good. Well, and I think, like, the some of this stuff that happens, whether it's an individual or teams, I think what we have to be doing is looking for the opportunity for um, additional focused coaching. Because... <laughs> We, I think Shannon, your example is a great example because what happened there was it opened a can of worms that needed to get further uh, effort and conversation going. And so I think sometimes it's possible for us to think of the debrief as the end, as the kind of this is the climax of this thing, when in many cases it should be thinking of it simply as the start of something yeah. and the opportunity to, and okay, based on what you've discovered and one of the things that you've been thinking about through this exercise that we did, how are some of the ways I can come alongside and support you and think through some of the questions that you now have and, and allow further coaching to happen. And maybe we even posture our time with people that way so they recognize that this doesn't have to be a one-off but could be part of a broad process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Shannon, I mean, I don't like it. It's not ideal, but even if you can get them together for, virtually for a you know, follow-up meeting with the group to continue that conversation. Um, yeah, those are, all, those are all good ideas. I, I appreciate everybody's feedback. Thank you. Well, folks, I hate to say it, but we have already used up the hour. We had some more challenging situations that we could have mentioned today, and I will even suggest that we uh, continue this conversation one month from today. In fact, uh, March will be the same day of same day of the month, the sixth of March, I believe it is, uh, on the next Wednesday that we get together. I will actually be in Istanbul in a uh, signature certification training with, we're gonna have 17 people there this time. So, uh, but I, the timing for this one works that I am planning to be here for the Coaches Cafe then. So I hope we will get to see all of you there. It's been a great conversation. I've gotten a lot of notes from you guys of things that I want to follow up on myself with my own coaching. I hope that you've gotten some good, um, some good ideas also helped you and I hope it's been a helpful session. So let me just encourage you to keep on doing what you can. The whole purpose of this is to build unity in the body of Christ so more people will know Jesus. Keep after it. If there's any way we can help you from the Grit Burtman leadership team, be sure to contact us. Lord bless you all and see you next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark.